Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode 13. Uh, today we have Michael Shanklin, who's a uh, he's a freedom seeker, truth seeker. Uh, he's the founder of Statism is Slavery. He's had some some experience in the Libertarian Party, and uh, today we're going to talk about um, you know the expiration of the Patriot Act, the uh, the fun-loving, uh, <laughs> wonderful-sounding USA Freedom Act, and perhaps the lovely surveillance state in general. But before we get to that, uh, Jeremy, can you just talk a little bit about um, the... Uh oh, our, our new licensing, yes. Uh, the, the Seeds of Liberty podcast is uh, now covered by the BIPCOT uh, no-gov license, which uh, allows reuse by anybody except governments and the agents thereof. Uh, you can find more information about that at BIPCOT.org. All right. So, um, so Michael, um, why don't you let, uh, just explain to us a little bit about how you came to where you are today, and then uh, and what you think on the uh, the present, uh, you know, bills that were passed that are supposedly going to give us more freedom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they they certainly use the uh, wording towards their favor. You know, uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Mike Shanklin. I have been a freedom act advocate for probably about a decade now, just under. Uh, before that, I was actually uh, somewhat of a Democrat, believe it or not. Um, uh, and then after that, I, I started learning some economics more in, in high school and college. Uh, became more of a Republican who was really pro-civil liberties. Uh, you know, I didn't want the government in marriage. I didn't want government to control guns. Uh, so not just economic issues, but things outside of that. Uh, and then, you know, I started to, to find out about the Libertarian Party. I went in and did that whole spiel. I started off on the bottom ranks just trying to help out at events, uh, climbed my way quickly up to the uh, executive committee. I got elected onto the executive committee. Then I got appointed as the director for the Libertarian Party of North Carolina, which is the fifth largest Libertarian Party, state party in, in uh, the United States. Anyway, I, I quickly uh, came to understand that the political system is not really winnable through the, the strategies that I was uh, trying to implement at the time. I was trying to basically, it's like you know entering into the mafia to turn them into the United Way. I think some other uh, philosophers have said something similar to that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I basically can echo them at this point saying that's that's what it feels like while you're inside of that, that trap. Uh, it's like a hamster wheel. You just keep running and running and running, but you're getting nowhere. And so after uh, about a year of that, I was actually uh, the, a campaign manager for a U.S. Senate candidate as well in 2010. His name was Dr. Mike Beitler. Really nice guy. I actually like him a lot. Um, you know, a minarchist uh, type guy, extreme minarchist. He even wrote a book called uh, Rational Individualism. I think he really, he almost mirrored Ayn Rand uh, when you, if you were to put their books together, except his was much more concise. <laughs> Not TLDR, right? But <laughs> uh, the thing was, uh, you know, I, I really saw the system. I was right inside of, of the cog, and uh, it was just like a, a battle you can't win. And so I, I thought, well, if I'm going to put a dent into the, the machine or into this state of system that's around me, I think the best way I can do it is just come out and be out. You know, some of these minarchists really tried to, to hide how bad government is so that they can water it down the message for some of the people who are still pro-government. And I think one of the things to do uh, especially back in the day, and I, I, I still sympathize with people who try to water down the message, don't get me wrong. There's a different message for every different person out there, different stro uh, fo uh, strokes for different folks, right? Uh, but at the time, I was really uh, heavy about just, let's get all the information out there laid on the ground. The state is an apparatus of the initiation of violence on peaceful people who just simply disagree. It is a system uh, that controls you and it enslaves you and you have no choice what are you going to do escape to some other status system so no matter where you go you're going to have a master over you and your property your your body and your property uh, i started to understand that only individuals can act and think right praxeologically i started getting deeper into uh, the, the whole deontological and normative ethics type side and uh, it really started to to <laughs> become quite clear to me that a voluntary society uh, which I believe one that rotates around individual property rights is the only just society and creates uh, also. Not only is it just in what I consider uh, ethical, but even more strongly, I think there's there's much more evidence that uh, shows outright uh, that it does have a utilitarian effect of increasing prosperity. So this is the the route I took I, in really extreme summarized terms. I hope that that summarizes it for you. If you guys don't mind, I can move right on to the surveillance state. 
Yeah, please. Uh, so I just I just want to know who's going to build the roads. <laughs> Construction <laughs> workers. <laughs> Construction workers. Not politicians, just That's like it. today. We... <laughs> uh, no, 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 it's a joke. <laughs> Must revert back to slavery. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. We have to have, even, even the pyramids were actually created by non-slave labor, most of them at least. So it even proves that the, uh, you, didn't, you, you could have done with the uh, non-aggression principle back in the day. Uh, so anyway, it, it's, it's not a time constant, right? It's, or it's not static. Uh, so I guess we could say freedom is static and the, in, uh, the state of slavery is, thank goodness, not static. So in other words, we can go away from, the, from the slavery. We can go away from bad. But, you know, looking at the world around us today, knowing what we know now, which is the initiation of violence can never be justified by any institution. So whether it's your grandma, uh, whether especially if you're over 18, right? I mean, if you're if you're under 18, uh, technically, some parents do have uh, the ability to stop you from jumping off a cliff when you're eight years old, et cetera. I mean, they can they can infringe on you. That's a whole other gray area. But let's just assume let's 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 not get into that whole 10 hour discussion uh, adults especially <laughs> i think we can all agree that adults especially can can uh, have their own capacity and that uh, along with that we should respect the individual choices of others as long as they are peaceful and don't infringe on other people and their property and so knowing that what i, what I was trying to lead to earlier was that you know your grandma uh, if you're uh, a, a stranger if if you're my nephew none of them nobody has the right to infringe on another peaceful person, let alone steal their property, right? And so uh, what we have around us today is a stated system that is just writ large. We have uh, the initiation of violence through taxes. If you disagree, you have you say, I, I do not give you my consent mm -hmm. to take this property, which I have earned and labored for, uh, and I don't agree with what you're doing with it, and you stop paying them, they will try to tackle you and cage you. And if you try to defend yourself and your family, they will slaughter you. This, this, so that is the initiation of violence. Taxation is the confiscation of property against another person's consent. I mean, it's, it's outright theft, whether you agree with, with it or, uh, or not, whether you like taxation or not, it is outright uh, theft. And it's even worse than that, it's extortion and racketeering. What we have around us today is a group of people called government. They, not all of us are government. It's not like I, I might live in this area that they try to geographically form as government, right? But I am not actually a part of the government. I want nothing to do with it. I see it as, once again, a system similar to the mafia that can only infringe on other people's freedoms, and it must infringe on their freedoms to have the money to go out and do more of these infringements. So it's like a circular. Uh, so so I, I take it down to the very base. I have a rational conclusion in my life, right? I don't just say, well, yes, taxation is theft, but I can justify it here. I say no, taxation and, and, and really theft and outright extortion and racketeering can never be justified. And so it's it's a definitely a radical viewpoint considered uh, what most people hear every day of uh, just going along with patriotism and nationalism and supporting whatever your parents supported and whatever their parents supported and their great grandparents and on and on. You know, it's, it's definitely uh, opening your mind and taking it to the next, uh, you know, asking the next questions that uh, historians and philosophers before us haven't asked. And so w with that knowledge, now that we know that the, syst the state around us is nothing more than a, a writ large in mass system of initiation of violence, the surveillance state becomes a little bit more apparent. And, and really, it's just like any other government program. And sometimes people, uh, they, they get shocked when I say, well, marriage itself is just another form of production. Everything is a form of production, you could argue, right? Every service, uh, every good that's created, it's all just a form of, of production. How we value that production is different. Well, with, with marriage, the government claims a out, an outright monopoly on the banning of marriage, right? Nobody else can go around and ban anybody else's marriage, but the government can, right? Once again, they have to steal money to have this policy, and then they go around and, and beat people and threaten to, to uh, tax them or fine them or give them penalties or just outright ignoring their, their individuality in essence if they do X, Y, and Z, if they get married in this certain area. I'm not saying government should ban marriage or not ban marriage. I'm saying it should, well, I guess I'm saying it shouldn't be in marriage whatsoever, right? Uh, just like th that form of production, you could go into almost any other act of, of government itself. It takes the initiation of violence to fund whatever the state does. And I, you know, I think the fears from the surveillance state come from, and I think there is a serious threat here. It's not like I am just some guy who doesn't believe it, that terrorists exist or like 
that you know ISIS is not real, it's just all made up by the government. There are really people over there who are upset. But I think the important thing to realize is why the surveillance state is supposedly needed right now. And this is more of, we're gonna be taking a trip into history if you guys don't mind. And of course, I wanna hear your, your opinions. Stop me at any time if you wanna add something, if you have a question for me, if you disagree with where I'm going. But I think this is a really historical fact that we need to look at when we're, looking, uh, when we're talking about the surveillance state. So the surveillance state itself is, it's, just, it's not just coming out of spontaneous order. It didn't just pop out of nowhere, right? It's not just like, oh, one day we, we needed, uh, we didn't need this uh, surveillance state and now we need it. Uh, really, we didn't need it for a very long time and for, for good reasons. Uh, but why is it that it came about? Well, the surveillance state really did come about because the, uh, there are a lot of people who are upset at the people who are technically in control of the state in this area. Once again, that's not me or you, right? They try to convince us we're part of the state and that you're part of this thing, but it's not us, you know, it's, it's them. It's it ain't me. <laughs> that's right, that's right. It's the Dick Cheney's, it's the Obama's, it's, it's those people, everybody that's in the, the, the left and right spectrum, those, those, that's who they're really upset. And they actually have some very good reasons to be upset, right? If you can imagine just for a second here, and I'm gonna kick this back over to the Middle East, but if you can imagine China coming over into the United States and setting up bases, hundreds of them, uh, at least dozens, depending on which regions you're talking about. And they set up these bases and they come in here and they basically do occupy and control these regions for a while. Uh, you know, I don't even like uh, tyrants that look similar to me. I can't imagine, you know, if I was a racist and <laughs> some tyrants <laughs> came from outside, I would be extremely upset, right? And I think most Americans would say, get out of here. Chinese government, right? I mean, we don't want, there's a reason we didn't, we waved the red, white, and blue flag. Even most Americans who are, you know, really heavy into patriotism and nationalism uh, realize they don't want that government, right? Uh, even though they could be doing the same laws and passing the same types of bills, it's just that it's not, it's not their government in their head, right? Because they've been conditioned into this one government. Well, China's, the, the at point, a, China's at a point where America's not really at that point yet, but China has all these regulations and bureaucracy piled upon all their people sure. they can't afford to enforce it so there's more anarchy in china than there is in the united states <laughs> because right now they can enforce a lot of their regulations um right. based upon preferential you know ideals because like I, this I, one I, agency might have fifty thousand regulations but they only enforce like ten thousand of them that's right, and I would argue that for almost every third world country out there. The reason, like some some guy, what was it, Storm Clouds Gathering one time, he was like, well, Mexico is basically anarcho-capitalism. I go, no, no, no. What they are is kind of like Somalia. They had so much statism, it just completely crumbled and failed. That is the initiation of violence. That's the lack of property rights, right? So I completely agree with your out, uh, perspective on this. Uh, so, you know, what I was coming at from this angle was uh, these people in the Middle East, have had that same thing happening to that analogy I had earlier, that hypothetical scenario of China coming over to your American lands and messing with that. It's, it's the same thing happening to the Middle East. These other bigger bullies, uh, they view, are coming in foreigners. They don't know what helicopters are. <laughs> they live in, in uh, opium fields, right? Let's be honest here. These people have no idea uh, the might, the military might from this region, let alone the, the economic prosperity that we built and technological advancements that of course have spurred off that. Uh, but they just see us as oppressors and people who came, came into Iran and overthrew Mosaddegh and put up the Shah, right? And I mean, that, that was, that's been happening since what, 1953 until 79, when the Shah ended up getting kicked out and had to flee into the United States. Anyway, that's a whole nother story in and of itself. But what they really do have a real reason to be upset these people from the Middle East. And sadly, a lot of them have uh, have been put in this situation where it's, well, uh, you know, there's been this state of system from America, the US government has grown, instead of growing in size here, which they have, have as well, but they didn't just grow here, they, they grew everywhere throughout the world, right? So people need to kind of see that perspective of it. But the, what has happened is because they've been bombing these regions and killing their children, these people have been put in the scenarios like some of them have no families left because they've been killed in, in bombs and they're just really upset and they do want to take it out. And, and I think um, a lot of them want people like us, the regular voters here who just sit down and eat our watermelon and, and, and uh, go vote on Tuesdays on, uh, you know, in November, 
on that first Tuesday, they want those people to kind of say, hey, do you even realize what's going in a, going on in our area and here in the Middle East for the last you know five decades plus? Really, you could go back to the big stick policies in Latin America of, of Theodore Roosevelt. We, we could go back to many examples of many other infringements of the United States government. The, the United States government has had a very big footprint throughout the world. And so it's really made a lot of people upset that these people are, uh, have come in here and they have, are viewed as occupiers. And so there's going to be some animosity towards the people in this region, either those who are the politicians who are actually doing it or the ones who are apathetic and just stand by and don't really even research it, kind of like most of our our, 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 our relatives and, and, our, and our friends, families, coworkers, et cetera, who just don't keep up with politics and don't research this stuff. It comes to a shock to them when there's a terrorist attack of any kind, right? Uh, but all the terrorist attacks are really trying to say, there's a, there's a reason behind them. Of course, the government won't, won't tell you that. The government will usually hide the fact uh, that they're being oppressors overseas and just say it's because of they hate us for our freedoms, you see. It's our freedoms, it's just yeah. because, That's <laughs> yeah. right, it's your, your freedom. So that's why we're gonna make this US Freedom Act. So let's, let's get into surveillance. I, I have to give some historical context to that to make it a little bit more tangible for people who are hearing it the very first time. So, you know, what happened with the terrorist attack in 2001, it, obviously horrible September 11th attack, uh, no, no voluntarist or anarchist uh, wanted that to happen. I want everybody to understand that. You know, that that was um, just a very sad scenario where a lot of t extremists really thought, "Listen, we're gonna we're gonna come over there and hopefully awaken America." And all it did was really upset and empower the government even more, right? And so the government grew exponentially from 9/11. Uh, uh, assuming 9/11 was done by terrorists. Assume. Right, right, right. So, you know, this is my perspective. So. I, I, I'm, I'm, I really do believe these people, you know, set this off. I'm not saying that somebody in government didn't have any kind of foreknowledge or wasn't a part of it in some way. I don't know. I don't know the whole official story. I don't believe that what the, the government tells me either, right? So the truth movement, the whole 9-11 commission report, I don't trust any you, of these well, people what, out there. What you have to do is you have to make two columns, right? Uh, for each side, right? You have to say, here's the pros and cons for the military industrial complex allowing this to happen. And here's the pro right. and cons of the terrorists succeeding with their thing. And there's way too many pros in that, in that military industrial complex. Like oh, yeah. they openly want attackers because that fuels their machine. Well, they can't let a good crisis go to waste, right? We exactly, know for sure. I mean, the, well, every government official knows this. The question is how much were they involved? You know, to me, I think I saw, the, uh, I think it's most likely, plot. this is what I think happened is, you know, Bush and Cheney probably had something on their desk warning about that and about a thousand other pieces of paper that were similar that they never read. It's government, they're just inefficient. They can't even produce sandwiches efficiently, right? They can't even make <laughs> shoelaces, let alone track all this paperwork that's coming in from the NSA and it, well, the, the, the organizations that were spying on us just with not as much power back in the day. But let, me, let me get to, to uh, you know, the surveillance state kind of connect all this with this historical context. So after the attacks, the government which of course wanted to grow. They always want to mm. grow because then it gives their friends more power. It gives them more jobs to give to their friends. Um, some of them really just believe that like more spending actually produces better results. There actually are those people. So there's a, it's a variety of, of people in the spectrum of, what, of, of beliefs and outcomes and consequences, right? So, you know, some people really just want to increase the, the size and scope of government to actually make us safe. They're really brainwashing that. Some of them just want to do it for Co completely corrupt reasons. So it's, it's all over the place on this. Uh, most of the people inside of government, I think, are, are trying to get their friends in, in, into higher places in government. It's more of a pat back, pull your hands up, you know, it's networking, good old boy type system. And so what, we've, what we saw is a lot of people rushed to create more things that would create more government. And one of those was the Patriot Act, right? And so what happened with the uh, US Patriot Act was it basically, it created this whole new organization. It, it, it empowered government to go out there and do a lot of things that were unconstitutional. And who would have thought, right? Well, <laughs> you know, like the constitution's was, in document, it's gonna save us. I was gonna say but, everything, every, well, we could have that argument. That's another argument that every, everything they do is, const is actually constitutional. So, so uh, you know, looking, looking at this size of, of government growing and the, some of the powers that could come through this, uh, the NSA obviously uh, got a huge spotlight, got lots of funding after 9-11, and uh, they were collecting bulk data from millions of people 
all across the U.S. So from phone calls, text messages, how much they have, we, we really don't know. We only know what Edward Snowden has produced. And when he produces something, the government doesn't deny it. We'll put it that way because it's, it's, it is true. I mean, there's times when they'll just outright say this is just not true from a whistleblower. The stuff with Edward Snowden, the officials in government, even Obama and Bush, they just ignore him, hoping that the, the problem will go away. Uh, but of course, all these unconstitutional things uh, came up, things that we could argue are unconstitutional. Well, which proves uh, my theory right about, you know, these whole conspiracy we were talking about before we started recording this. I, that's why I really don't believe too much into hardcore tinfoil hat, you know, um, conspiracy theorist, like loose lips sink ships and, you know, point answered everything you know in the dictionary see edward snowden like he and then there's conspiracy conspiracy conspiracies about him that maybe the nsa doesn't even have all this control and they did this as a as an act <laughs> to to you know say we can do all this you know so it's it's uh it's one of those things where you have a fascistic state with the united states uh they always need to prop up and look more powerful than they uh are on the world stage and uh, it's one of those things where it's very, very impractical. Like when you basically tell the world, you know, hey, uh, as long as you don't use an electronic device, you can pretty much do whatever you want. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like uh, that's essentially what they're like. If, if 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 a logical person or a logical government was doing the Patriot Act, uh, they would have done it uh, in secrecy and never told anybody. And we wouldn't even heard about the bill. It would have been created under executive orders in some vague language. So it, to me, it just uh, shows the utter incompet incompetencies of of government. Once again, that you know that they can't even do that right. The supposed protection of 333 million people, you know, and then you mix that with more Americans are being killed by their own police officers than terrorists. It's it just like, why are we doing this again? I'll take the chance with the terrorist. I'll take, <laughs> you know, bathtubs kill more people than terrorists. Like, I ta I'll take the chance with the bathtub. Lightning, right? Yeah, I know. There's so many other things. I, there was this long list. Uh, it's kind of like the list of occupations that are more dangerous than police officers. It's actually really long yeah. you know, yeah. before you get to that. But you don't <laughs> right. think that. It's like the flip side of it. So, you know, let, uh, let me kind of summarize real quick on the Patreon because I do want to get everybody else's opinion on this. And I do appreciate you guys' uh, letting me spout this off for a little while. But it's really good to get this historical context along with the uh, current events. So we have the, the, the Patriot Act. It was in existence. And it was in existence for what? almost 14 years it just went and expired a few days ago and right after that expired they passed another bill called the usa freedom act you know patriot act to freedom act i guess they're, they're trying to they're, i think they're still fooling a, a few people out there but not as many as when the patriot it's act got, initially it's got came freedom out. in the name mike how can you be against freedom? <laughs> I, I, it's, it's how do you hate I'm I'm moving right. if I see the Gun Liberation Act. I'm just <laughs> I'm running. <laughs> hey, don't give them ideas. Come on. Yeah, yeah. The, the libera liberate yourself from your money is is what taxation really is. <laughs> All right. So what what this is? Let me let me break this down for people. The, the Patriot Act once again enabled bulk uh, monitoring and collection of cell phones. Uh, you know, all kinds of data out there, including a lot of stuff with webcams. Uh, of audio from computers. They, the NSA actually has been um, found to have stopped shipments of computers coming from eBay and from Amazon and installing malware to them. Of course, they're going to say they're only doing it to the people who they think are terrorists, et cetera, but who knows, right? I mean, this is the whole thing. How much, how's it going to, this is the thing. Once it gets in with one organization like this, then this, the FBI and the DEA and the rest, they're going to get these powers too, right? So it's just a front to give it to the rest of them so the domestic tyranny can expand. But the reason that the USA Freedom Act has come about, in my opinion here, and this is, this is now my speculation coming up to the current events section, my thing is that the USA Freedom Act uh, was made just to kind of distract people and to quiet them down from the uproar that the U.S. Patriot Act has created because it's not, there the amount of, of uh, antagonists, if you could say, really 
we could say protagonists from our position are fighting against the Patriot Act. Those who are fighting against the Patriot Act for all these years, they're not going away and, they're, and they're, the people are growing. And it was stemming from a lot of pro-privacy uh, rights organizations. So a lot like, like, once again, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a, a great organization that fights for your privacy online, uh, especially against uh, the state, right? They don't like, they don't trust politicians and their ilk to get your information and to use it, et cetera. And so they wanted something that was better than the Patriot Act. And they realized, you know, this is once again in October 29th, 2013, I just looked it up, is when the, the USA Freedom Act first was introduced into the US Congress. So that was a year and a half ago. And this is because they've been fighting against the US uh, Patriot Act for a while. Once again, though, you have to remember by the time that these bills from when they start to when they're actually going to be passed, like the U.S. Freedom Act was, uh, USA Freedom Act was just what two days ago, it has completely and radically changed from its original point. So that the document that the EFF originally started to support it at the beginning has completely altered over the last year and a half, uh, and it's taken away a lot of those individual uh, privacies that were originally built into the bill. So essentially, what they have tried to do is make a, a kind of, they tried to block a loophole that allowed uh, the NSA to get around the Patriot Act. And I think what most of us are going to realize is, and the people who are working right now at the NSA, that nice little uh, water-cooled computer system out in Utah, they're not going to have to go find new jobs, right? They're not going to go anywhere. They're going to still be sitting there. They're not, nothing's going to change, right? I'm glad people are fighting against the system. I think Rand Paul has the right position overall, right? Not that I agree with him or want to vote for him or anything. I think on this one thing, he was right to, be, to try to block the Patriot Act from going through. It's a horrible bill. The question is, is the USA Freedom Act really that big of a step forward for us and humanity and freedom, et cetera? And I would argue, obviously, just like most other bills that are repositioned bills, Right, something we call in marketing is reposition. Uh, I would argue no, that this doesn't really have that big of an effect. It's just trying to publicly block a loophole while now they'll have it privately loopholed somewhere else. So, you know, the, the whole thing here is that uh, once government gains an inch, they'll take a mile. They have this thing in, 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 uh, in sales, what you try to do is get your, I don't know if you guys knew this guy, I'm, I'm the, I do a lot of sales and marketing stuff and I have always have for my whole life. And we have this analogy of, it's called the, the camel, getting the camel's nose out of the tent. Because if the camel, in, it, when you're out in the desert and it's a, snow, a sandstorm starts to kick up, you, everybody rushes into the tent for the, you know, the 15 minutes or until the sandstorm is out. That poor camel has to suffer out there, right? So what you'll notice is uh, for the first, if you don't stop it too, this really gets uh, quicker and quicker, then the camel will try to poke its nose inside of the tent. And if you let it get its nose in, it'll keep going and it'll keep going. And before you know it, the whole camel's back and hump and it's butt, the whole camel's in the tent, right? You don't have room in the tent for the camel. So you have to stop it in the act. This is what we're seeing here is the, the infringements of, of government, of, of our freedoms by government. Uh, the, the U.S. Patriot Act on a cosmic scale, if you look at this for hundreds of years to come in the United States region, it was just this, the, really the pinprick starting point that of, of what will soon be a, a gushing blood hole of, of non-privacy rights, right? This is just the beginning of the extreme tyranny that I think we are gonna see as far as privacy goes in our, on our communications. That's another question that some, even people inside the Austrian economic uh, you know, perspective argue about is, well, what is privacy? Why do you think you have privacy out in the internet? You know, with houses, it's easier because you can put up uh, actual mirror and walls here, but people can hack your computer. And, you know, this just gets into a whole other argument. Obviously, from my perspective is you do not, uh, you did not agree with at and you, you thought, most people thought that it was unconstitutional, that it was against the laws of this land to have the government spying on us and our telephone records. People thought that. And then another thing happened, right? So it's it's kind of like the, uh, the 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 person who has always lied to you your whole life, and then they come up to you after you've trusted them ninety nine times, 
And every those 99 times they 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 were exposed as being liars, and they come up for a hundredth time, and they say, "Listen, just this one last thing. I promise, I'm telling the truth, right? Are you going to believe them? No, right? But that's just what people continuously do, and it's because of the patriotism, the nationalism. Don't look at their actions. Just think about what they're, you know, just listen to, to their to their campaign fear. speeches and what. what the, yeah, a lot of it is fear, right? Because without the system, how will we have the roads? How will we have arbitration, how will we have, uh, you know, defense, how will we have uh, clean water, et cetera. I mean, and, and those are legitimate concerns, but the the automatic litmus test for this that points people towards government is that's where people really go awry, right? So the, the U.S. surveillance state that we're seeing around us today, it's nothing more than an extension of government than the growth of government. And uh, we have to realize that for what it is and that the people who are fighting for it today, I don't want to knock on the Rand Pauls, I just think that a lot of what they're doing uh, today is just it, it's going to be swept up under the rug over the decades to come as people ignore them and forget about them and the system continues to roll on and most people just don't. It, it, that's really the, the, the main problem here. I guys, think uh, most people just don't research this stuff, you know, you know, uh, Mike, you were talking about the uh, the evolution of the of the Freedom Act. And, you know, and, and I can see some people who, who research that and they're like, you see the government is corrupt this bill is corrupt and 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 the way i i would respond is like is like no it's not our government is corrupt is government equals corruption always <laughs> this is not a this is not a special case you know you know because it's it's like you know we're not we're not only against this bill we're not only against obama right we're we're not only against the united right. states we're against the the idea of having rulers right the idea of a monopoly on initiated aggression. And when you give a select group of people that monopoly status, there is absolutely no way that there will be, you know, efficient allocation of resources that, you know, the customers can be happy and you can't even call them customers because <laughs> they have no other choice but but to be funded by by threat of violence, um, the uh, you know, the ruling the ruling elite. So so um, it's not an anomaly and and to think that um, you know, like uh, that, that we're going to use the state, to, talking about politics, that we're going to use the state to end the state <laughs> is, is, again, right. a little bit. I mean, I mean, although, you know, I, I, I applaud people who actually try, you know, but uh, it's not my preferred means of, of, of getting the message out there. But um, well, but, but yeah, so this is not this is not an anomaly. That's, that's all I want to say. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, just imagine if, if the state actually they, they, there's a reason they have to say it's about rich and free because they cannot admit that this stems from them and being oppressors for the last 50 years overseas. This is the whole surveillance state. The reason that it's needed is because we had a state that was out there meddling with other people and then pointing to our, towards you and me and saying, it's all of us over here that are doing it. Don't get mad at me, the military industrial right. complex who's right. over here in your, we're all America, <laughs> right? We're we, all we a are, part of this we are government. <laughs> and we're doing good, right? It's, a, it's the same thing that's at all tyranny. It's always sold under the guise of being good. So this is, this is the whole joke is that they're going to come in here. To, you know, we're going to go over to these other regions, oppress them, and then just act dumbfounded when, when some of them, you know, don't like us and then we have a bunch of terror cells that we actually funded half of them because they were fighting against russia well you know this is the thing there, there was a time when they were fighting against the communists and and it's the same thing we've turned into the communists i mean that, that that's <laughs> the same thing if you look at it historically a lot of like afghanistan and those regions over there were fighting against the the russians for years we were funding them that's where you know uh, al qaeda really st stemmed from was the taliban which we funded the taliban so you could say we funded osama bin laden it was not directly anybody who tells you that i think is, is you got to question their facts but it was indirectly sure al obama or osama bin laden came years after we had originally funded the taliban but the, the the point here is that they were fighting against the the russians because they were trying to take their freedom and tell them what to do in their region, right? Now, we went over there and did the same thing. In fact, many people from South uh, Korea are, are still kind of upset that the government of the U.S. government has so much control in their politics, right? It's kind of like Hawaii when, when Hawaii turned into the U.S. It was literally just a, a coup. They just went in there and took over Hawaii. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that yep. video of, yeah, that's crazy. It just is like, oh, yeah. And now you're a state. And they're like, what? <laughs> and so there's, I can see the resentment of it, you know? So, you know, lots of stories like this, but now it's just happening. It just kills me how people can't see. And that's, that is not, you know, people fighting for our freedom. 
That is people fighting for control of a region that is way over there, has nothing to do with me, yet they steal my tax, my, my money through the form of taxes to pay for it, of course. So this whole thing wouldn't even be a problem if, if we didn't have a state that was created that used these, this misallocation of resources, our tax dollars, incorrectly and improperly going over there and oppressing other people overseas. It's just, and then making me pay for it. And if I don't pay for it, I go to a cage or I'm killed if I try to defend myself from their, from their extortion. It's just the whole thing. It's like a horror movie that is actually real, you know? <laughs> like, how did this happen? Yeah, well, people are, I mean, you're right. It's just people don't see it. And it's, it's unfortunate because once you do step on this side of the fence, uh, you, you see the contradiction so easily. But that's the point. They, they're so, that nationalism, that, you know, that, that idea that, that we, like, you know, you said that, that they really think that we are the government and they, they can't separate that in their minds. So when you present, like what you said earlier about, you know, just imagine if, if the Chinese government or any government came over here and did stuff like that. Most people can't even get that into their head because they just imagine anything that goes on outside outside their walls is done for their good and they don't have to see it so they don't recognize it. So if you say, well, if they come here, oh, that, that could never happen. Well, then you bring up something like 9-11 and say, well, here's them coming in and doing this. Oh, that's totally different. That's a terrorist attack. Well, please explain to me how it's any different when we send our troops, our, our troops, I, I hate, I, I see, I, I've been, I swear I was going to stop saying that, their troops, when they start sending their <laughs> troops over there to, to for whatever reason, uh, nation build, you know, nation building, d d democracy spreading, whatever they want to call it, you're sending troops over there and giving the okay to kill people at random. How is that different? Well and well, then they go into a fit of rage and don't want to talk about let's, it anymore. This is the honesty part that nobody's willing to accept right here. And that is that the Taliban are simply more honest than the U.S. government, right? The U.S. government, the people who are over there, they might be standing there and looking peaceful in their, in their military stuff. And they're just, they don't have to point the guns at people because they know that the guns are implicitly backed, right? They're already there. The gun's always pointed at you, even if it's not pointed at you, right? So they can go into an area and they don't have to point a gun at anybody. It's kind of like slave masters back in the day when you went to a plantation and the slave master said, do X, Y, and Z. The slave, you didn't have to fight every single slave one-on-one -on -one and, and get them to do all the work. They just knew that if you, they didn't do it, they'd get shot or hung, right? I mean, the, the, the threat was always inherent. And, and at least the Taliban were a little more straightforward and honest with theirs because they just outright killed people in, in a horrible attack, whereas the, uh, the, the rest of the governments of the world kind of hide behind their, their terroristic plots and plans, and they don't have to enforce them uh, as open and publicly as the Taliban does to get the attention. Um, my two points about the Patriot Act were and it, technology is going to outpace government always and uh, unless they can seize control of it in a fascistic manner and you know these these companies are always going to cede to the government because the government is who regulates them and they don't want to get regulated out of business so it's easier to hand the government the keys in certain facets of their company than to be defiant well i, I just wanted to make a, a point about the uh, the surveillance state um th those people who say um <clears throat> Well, if you have, if, if you've done nothing wrong, then you have nothing to hide, right? <laughs> and I, I love when people tell me that. One of the first things I ask them is, uh, um, when you change your clothes at night, do you do you leave the window blinds open and the doors open, <laughs> or do you close them? <laughs> right. What's the, what's the password so your to your email? Yeah. So your neighbor, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So your neighbors don't see. You know, why? What's the purpose of privacy? Do we want privacy because we're all, you know, secretly criminal and like plotting to, you know, do violent things and, you know, assassinate people? Or do people just enjoy privacy because that's that's a part of being a human being? You know, it's like it's like, um, you know, uh, when you when you when you do something and, and you're and you're being you know, you're being watched, you're going to act differently. What's that called? The chill effect, right? When you do something and you know you're being watched, and then when, when you know you're in private, you're completely different, right? People are completely different behind behind closed doors, right? So, so, uh, <laughs> so you know, to tell people that you know everybody can be can be searched and surveilled and their privacy violated because you know if you've done if you've done nothing wrong, you have nothing to hide. <clears throat> well, what? we have to we have to turn that um, 
that logic on its head and go the same thing. What about the people who, who do search and violate other people's privacy? What about them? Are they being violated themselves? Who's watching them? <laughs> Who's surveilling them, right? Well, this so. is why private, private property rights are so, they're the backbone of a free society. And I mean, what, what, let's think about this for a second. Privacy and then the word private property. I'm, I'm just saying there's a little bit of a correlation there that's positive, right? Privacy, private, it, it, they stem from the same root. And I think it's important to realize that, you know, our individual, we are individuals. It's, it's, it's such an anti-individualistic view that you have to go out there and just control the everybody, right? You just got to go out there and control everybody. It's very anti-individualistic. And I, I, you can just tell that the society around us has gone away from the individualistic roots that actually made this country somewhat better than the rest of the regions. The reason it did have some prosperity for so many years is because it did have such a strong individualistic, or even relative to where we are today or not, it, you know, that's that's on the side. But it, throughout the world, it was historically one of the most individualistic uh, societies. And now you, it just has been a complete turnaround from that. Uh, what I see in politics today is that the the anti-individualists have really won. I mean, they're winning, and you know these the the U.S. Patriot Act and the U.S.A. Freedom Act. These are all just uh, secondary effects of an anti-individualistic uh, and an anti proprietarian society. Yeah, well, this this is the direction that all governments eventually head, and you know they. They, they thrive on that fear that was mentioned earlier that people have of, of the what ifs and they always continue to build and that's you know that's the thing you know like you were saying Michael even with even with this particular government that was supposed well it, it was you know historically speaking the most limited ever and it in 238 years we're here now um, but it didn't even take that long because that that's something else that was that was discussed earlier about how the the effect of of the patriot act is is not even is not even the whole picture because this has been going on for even longer than that that just when it became known you know because as was mentioned the the nsa actually began before the patriot you know the, a lot of people mistakenly believe that the you know the patriot act created the nsa no that was it was around before that their powers just were not as vast supposedly um, you know, it, it goes all the way back to before, before the CIA with the, the, the creation of the OSS. You know, it's the same thing. Like these programs start and they expand because that is what they do. They, you know, they're just bottomless pits because they have to they have to perpetuate themselves. And the only way you perpetuate uh, 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 not even the surveillance state, but just the supposed, you know, surveillance institutions that are out there for our good that before they were turned on us. Uh, when they were spying on everybody else, that was supposed to be okay. Um, but how you keep that type of organization or even the military in business is creating more fear. So you have to have these enemies around the world to constantly keep the citizenry convinced that all these things are necessary. And that also touches on what, you know, Michael's talking about with the historical aspect. You know, it goes back and back with the, you know, our, you know, the ISIS before that was Al-Qaeda, before that was the Taliban, before that was the Mujahideen, um, you know, and it, it, it goes on and it, it happens every time, whether it's for good intentions or um, purported good intentions, um, and they arm these, you know, the, 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 the U.S. government takes, takes the taxpayer money and goes and arms these different people in these different areas. And eventually, they all end up turning on the U.S. government. Why? Exactly what you said, Michael, that they, you know, were bombing the heck out of their areas and um, their families ended up getting killed. I mean, I'd be pissed off, too. <laughs> you know, you can't really it's it, you can't really blame these people. But there's and the the average citizen is so wrapped up in the propaganda that they don't they don't even want to think about that. They're they're just as convinced as the military. It's, are it's these very are in, they're inhuman. That's what they're convinced of. Um, it, so they don't even want to think that it could be, you know, what if it was me? You know, I'm somebody I lost. You know, my cousin was in was in the was in one of the towers when it went down. And he's one of the one of you know, one of them that didn't make it out. So, you know, I know what it's like to have somebody else come to my neighborhood <laughs> and bomb the place, basically. You know, it doesn't feel good. Um, so, but people just, they don't want to look at that because they've been so programmed that it's, it, they're, these people are evil. They want to hurt us. And it's well, sad. Well, yeah, it's hard to see the tyranny of the empire when you're living in the empire. 
Well, we live in the Empire. We yeah. see it. Yeah. <laughs> we see it, but it's very hard. It's yeah, awfully yeah. hard, it, I would it, say. It yeah, you know, most people, I, I, the people who do know about it um, usually have more intellect. That's what I found. You know, I mean, there's and there's not many people with intellect. You know, here, here's the thing, too. What you're going with is, is this blame thing. And, you know, they're, they are looking around uh, to blame a bad person. In this case, it's uh, terrorists and stuff. Uh, but this is a pop quiz for everybody out there, even the guests in the, uh, in the audience. Uh, what, wh who is it or what is it that gets the blame when they can't find a person or an organization or group? Does anybody know? It's, it's the market. <laughs> so oh, yeah. the market gets yeah. the blame, right? <laughs> if, it's, if it's not a person you can blame, it's the market, you see. And uh, this, that's your two options if you're stated. So I expect them to pull one of the two levers, right? A is a, a, a person's name, <laughs> B is the market. So there's this little, it's like the Wizard of Oz guy in the back. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I, I, like, I like the idea of the, uh, the state as the self-licking ice cream cone that is constantly expanding. And it's, and it's the, to me, it's the, <laughs> it's, it's the true perversion of natural market, market forces that uh, you know when a, a business has to rely on it you know the quality of its product or service you know if it if it fails and it you know you know it it poisons some of its customers it's most likely not going to get more customers and more funding right <laughs> but the exact opposite is with a government program right the more it fails the more funding it gets we just didn't give it, it enough fuel <laughs> <laughs> we just got, got to throw more more taxpayer money at it it's going to it's going to get back up soon don't worry about it um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah that, you know it's it's the nature it's the nature of government to expand and it expands until until the people can support no longer and the and the tax base is completely crushed and uh, and then that's when you got you know violent revolution and uh, you know wealth transfers and you know monetary crisis and uh, and the people unfortunately have not understood their true history because most of them refer to their government history <laughs> unfortunately yeah. and so they have a skewed sense of history and and so we we experience all these uh, you know repetitions even even things that are happening now like in Venezuela like in Colombia you know like you know horrible um, monetary crises and and skyrocketing inflation people fleeing to bitcoin and uh, and people still don't they don't seem to care they, they you know what you know what I gotta get my 401k you know I gotta save for my retirement I gotta put money in the bank <laughs> don't come to me about this Federal Reserve you know Ponzi scheme Ponzi scheme crap <laughs> all right you know the difference do you know the difference between a a, a status professor or a, excuse me a status historian and a freedom loving historian. I'm like David Friedman over here with some freedom jokes, right? <laughs> no, 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 Versus destruction, broken window fallacy, et cetera, broken glass. Right? I mean, it's just, <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a two worlds dichotomy. And once you really see the historical value from this professorial per perspective and viewpoint, it really does make more sense, huh? Yeah, <laughs> totally. I, uh, I, don't, I just don't understand the end game of, of the Patriot Act or just the mass surveillance. Uh, like, how many years do they have to go, like, before they have to do another false flag to ramp up all the, the you know, religious fervor that's behind statism to say, oh, we need this and you need more. Because, like, that's literally all it takes is another false flag, right? I don't even think they need false flags, really. Like, you don't need a false flag to have that fervor. You're going to have – something small happen. I mean, relatively small when you look at Pearl Harbor. I'm not trying to say – it wasn't a big moment or anything like that. What I am saying, though, you know, when you look at all battles that have been fought through, I mean, D-Day was how many more times serious than than Pearl Harbor? M most, you know, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, we're talking lots more deaths, right? Uh, but when you look at what happened in Pearl Harbor, it, it might have been small, but it did have this big effect. You don't need false flags. That was my point. So it was something really small, but they were able to blow it up into something much bigger. That's what I was trying to get at. So, you, you know, they don't really need false flags you can have some small boston marathon thing that's really small and look at all the people who went out you know waving flags as their individual freedoms 
we're just being torn to shreds and houses being kicked in and stuff. I mean, it's just, it, it blows me away. The martial law that was imposed federally, it, it really blows you away when you, when you see that, you know, you, you don't even need it. Like it's one small thing can last for decades and decades. 9-11 is really a small event, a couple thousand, 3,000, 4,000 people. I mean, I'm just saying on the cosmic scale from all war and death and cetera and disease, this is a speck. You know, it's like a needle in a haystack, but they weren't able to build it into this 20, 30 year thing, right? So in, I guess you could say anything, any any type of event I bring up, somebody could say, well, there was actually, it could have been a conspiracy. So it's hard to find one where there's absolutely no way that there's no conspiracy ever 100%. So the Gulf uh, of Tonkin. Is, right, my point is there are some crazy outlier people in the world. Out of 6 billion, 7 billion people in the world, there's going to be a couple bad eggs, right? You're going to have some, some bad apples out there and they're going to do some stupid things and bomb people and hurt. And you can just, you, you, that's all you need. You need maybe one of those every 50 years, in my opinion, and it just keeps the fuel going. As long as people stay in this, I think religion does help like what you're talking about. It, it basically helps put up blinders because once again, most religions are just about following that's, you know, they're, they're, here's a set of things that you need to learn and just follow that versus, you know, open uh, the, the blinders, take them off and say, you know, ask more questions, really. It doesn't ask for that. And, and I, I can see how not only a patriotic uh, fervor is created from a religious perspective and it happens in any region. So it's not just the, 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 the Christian right wing. And, and technically, you can say that there's a lot of Democrats of technically Obama and Joe Biden and all of them are Christian leftists. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, like, you know, you know what I'm getting at here. The, the America really is a supposed Christian nation. And, and that does perpetuate uh, blind allegiance to whichever ruler pops up and says, I do that thing, too. Right. So because people want to emulate uh, what they think is good. And if they think that's good, that's what they're going to try to go and do. So, you know, it is a mind screw, but as far as the false flags, I don't even think they really need false flags. I just think there's just so many people who just wanted to do the, the status thing because they think it's the right thing. And that's all they need. Like that, I don't think they really have to do much else, sadly. You know, I wish, you, I wish we could just stop false flags that existed and then all of a sudden we'd have this, you know, all everybody just see, it, it just doesn't make sense to me, though. You know, it's just like, no, people really are believing into the status mindset, and that's really the underlying problem here, you know? Well, so that's, yeah. that's where I come from, yeah. Well, yeah, that makes sense because, I mean, I, I look at statism itself as a religion because, you know, it, yeah. it, it's just an extension of, as you were saying, you know, all the other religions, the same thing, you know, you're, you're taught to follow, you're taught to obey this, this alleged authority, and you're taught it from a very young age, you know? It's, it's beaten into your head. Uh, as soon as you start going, you know, if your parents aren't, you know, the uber patriotic type that, that teach you this stuff before you get to, you know, government institutions, as soon as you get there, then it's force fed to you through exactly as you were, you, you know, you were describing the, you know, the, the history versus the uh, freedom loving professor. School teachers the same way. Right. You are, you know, you are, you are forced to obey them and they, they teach you this, this, this version of history that you know, at best has been whitewashed. At worst is, you know, outright lies. Some of the stuff they teach <laughs> they teach kids in school, it's just horrible. Automatically viewed as an authority too, right? Yeah, well, exactly, because that's the thing. You're, you're, it's, I, I mean, I, I'm somebody, I'm a firm believer that statism actually starts at home. It, it's usually unwittingly, but parents, force this authoritarian nature on their children because that's how they were brought up you know with corporate punishment or whatever it is just you know the whole you know or just so many people out there that actually believe they own their children you know it's just this authoritarian nature because that's how they were raised and that's how they're and it's not just raised. neutral it's not just like we just do it it's if you don't do it bad things happen right well exactly then well it's, it's then learned helplessness kids. right yeah, yeah just, exactly. Oh, you guys really went off the deep end. <laughs> Sadly, you know. Yeah, but it's that that's where it begins and it go and it they went then the way they get into school it's the same thing. You've already been taught, you know, you you you're sent off to school and you're taught, "Okay, now you have to listen to the teacher because they're the one in charge now and they're the authority." So, you know, you go in there and and your young fertile mind is just like, "Okay, well, you're supposed to teach me stuff, so teach me." So whatever you're told and, you know, critical thinking is not taught you know, all throughout school, logic, logic is not taught outside of the field of mathematics. Um, real economics is not taught. Real history is not taught. When you don't have those things given to you, it makes it a lot harder to break out of that, that mold that you're put in. And, 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 you know, you just are forced 
out into the world not knowing jack shit <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and well, well, and and it's like okay now what and if you're you know if if your family was already like that then you'll continue down the path you know maybe you'll get sucked up you know you know in the worst case scenario you'll get you get sucked up in the poverty draft and end up in the in the military and then you get a, then you get propagandized even more and it's just yeah. it is that mindset that pe like you said I, I i happen to agree with you i don't think false flag flags are all that necessary maybe if we manage to if we just the collective everybody managed to have a, an amazing 50 year run where nothing happened which is damn near impossible um because right. as you mentioned there's always those few crazy people and that's all you need because the politicians are really good at that jumping on crises and making it even if it has nothing to do with a particular area or a particular set of people or a particular state of people they will find a way to make it hit home to them and then it's oh no the school thing yeah, go ahead. Real, real quick, but while, while, while we're, we're talking on that school thing, I, I wanted to mention, but every time I, I send my son to uh, go to this little daycare school, I, I, I try to tell him, you know, he can't really talk that well to me, <laughs> but I try to always tell him and let him know, you know, question everything, even question things I tell you, right? I mean, like, double check me, and if I'm wrong, be, be strong and confront me and say, this is what I found to be right, and I'll let you know where I agree or disagree, right? But if whatever a teacher tells you, that does not mean they're right. They they might have some knowledge on a lot of great things, but double check everything. You know, don't just trust blindly what anybody ever tells you. Make sure you, you know exactly. You know, go go get some reinforcement on those facts. So, you know, I'm always trying to tell my kids uh, to not only question uh, others but also myself and themselves. Right. So they have a, a preconceived uh, notion about something to challenge that as well. Uh, so I, I completely agree with you that you know that's a very dangerous uh, scenario that we can put kids into because they have no idea. And I can remember when I was younger, I was in that scenario and I just thought, oh, that person's older than me. I can remember, guys, when I was really young, and I'm talking like five to eight, ten in those years, I, I could be like, man, adults, they really got it figured out. They really understand <laughs> like everything, like like – they, they feed themselves and like do their own di uh, uh, dishes and, and uh, you know, laundry and all this stuff. I was really impressed by all these adults. And as I got older, it really, and it's probably now today, I'm like, man, most adults don't know anything. They are such <laughs> slackers. I just, I'm blown away by it. You know, it's just it's this complete reversal. Of, but it was because back in the day, uh, people didn't tell me to question everything and to see it how I should have, which was like today. So I was kind of stuck in this like fake world that really shouldn't have existed in my mind, but did just because I didn't have the proper guidance. And, you know, I think at least on that one topic, I think overall I have really good guidance in my life. Uh, you know, my parents did a pretty good job overall, but it is, at least on that one topic. So, yeah, I just wanted to stress the fact that I agree with you that we should challenge this notion of just, you know, age is uh, absolute. Uh, even when I get older, I always tell people, make sure you challenge me, especially as I get older. I might even make more mistakes as I become more senile. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Alzheimer sets in, and it's uh, what was that? What was I was saying again? Yeah, where? <laughs> what, what is this? A show? What is this? <laughs> yeah, I right, so, so, more so, so frequent we, brain farts. <laughs> so, so I think we should give our give our closing remarks um, before we sign off. Uh, I just wanted to say about about the um, the child rearing that um, you know my approach is I I try to to envision my children as equals, right? As peers, like like I am their advisor, I'm their friend, you know? I'm not an authority figure and that they should obey or listen to just because I'm bigger and stronger and older. And right? have legal because, control. Right, right. <laughs> legal control, yeah. So, so you know, I, uh, yeah, that, that's a good point, um, uh, Michael, that you say, you know, you tell your kids, question me, you know? If I make a mistake, you tell me. And uh, and I try to do that with my kids too. Like I don't want to talk to them like I'm like I'm an authority, like I'm over them, like I have more experience. I mean, we do have more experience, but that does not necessarily mean that we are more intelligent, right? There's an intelligence in kids that is kind of innate that perhaps we do not have because we were all of us went to public school. I think I think right, all of us went to public school, government school. So so 
some of that I would argue has been beaten out of us and those kids that have not gone have not had that experience it's intact right and so they already have an innate intelligence that is far superior to what we have right so so they will develop much much differently so so that's that's my thing is is you know I, I you know, there's certain instances, of course, when you have to assert yourself, like you know, you don't want your kid running in the street, you don't want your kid doing, you know, for basic safety reasons. But other than that, like I try as much as possible not to assert my strength or my, you know, my uh, my age over them as much as possible because you want them to feel empowered, and that's how my kids are. They they have they're fearless. You know, when they come across other adults, most of the time they introduce themselves. They're very open and very friendly. You know, they're not afraid to talk to adults, which, which unfortunately is so common. I see other kids, they just, they cower and they, they're quiet. You know, their parents tell them, sit there, be quiet. And they do, they sit there and they be quiet. And, and, and to me, it, it reflects a genuine authoritative uh, and uh, violent parenting structure that, that must be in the house for that kid to be so obedient. <laughs> you know, and it's so unnatural to be so obedient, you know. So, uh, so yeah, so, so that's, that's what I would tell parents is treat your kids as equals, as peers, as, you know, as an advisor. Have them listen to you because your advice has value, right? Because it, not because you said so. <laughs> so that's what I would say. <laughs> All right, let me, let me make my closing statements real quick, guys. First of all, thanks for having me on the show. I think this is great. I think you guys uh, you know, need to keep this up. Of course, I'm the, the fifth wheel over here, but I, I, do, I do support everything you guys are doing, and I do thank you guys for having me on the show. As far as the parenting thing, I think you, know, you really nailed it. And I try to do the same thing with my kid. I think it's important for, for our kids to... Uh, be challenged as much as possible and so in that fact i try not to exert my capacity and their lack of capacity but i try to empower their capacity instead uh going to the surveillance state thing i, I i'm glad we were able to talk about this tonight because it is uh, something that's a is a symptom of a much deeper problem right and that's once again the initiation of violence on peaceful people the theft of their property against their will is really what has led to this so if there's anything you want to be upset about uh, with the surveillance bill it's should it stem all the way back to the initiation of violence which enabled the funding of that thing so <laughs> hopefully we can look at the funding source as well as have disdain for the outright program itself. Sometimes most people, even those, especially those who consider themselves conservatives, only look at the glass half empty, right? And um, so as far as that goes, just remember, the government's always gonna try to push for more power. They're going to give you a bill. Really, this is what we could say, the Patriot Act was like 10 steps forward and this is a, half, a quarter step back and then they secretly take a step forward again. So <laughs> that's kind of like what this is. And um, on that note, I think I'm gonna say good night and I appreciate it again being on the show. Do you, uh, do you have any plugs? Uh, right now I have all of my stuff. I have actually millions of hits on my videos on, on the internet, but I have made them all private uh, over the last year because I'm back in the private sector pretty heavy doing some big things. So. I really have to keep a tight lid on uh, wow. on gotcha. my old network, unfortunately. But I will be back in full swing. Well, you know, hopefully I can retire soon, and I will be giving it my one hundred percent for freedom, have no doubt. I understand. I mean, uh, you always have to protect uh, your uh, your your family's future, and right. you know uh, what we say uh, is very controversial. Um, yeah. Even though it's like, hey, I want you to be free, it's like. Ah! <laughs> oh totally it's 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 funny how many people who are pro-diversity try to silence me and uh yeah it's it's very hypocritical but when you you have to fight it to see it and um unfortunately i'm one of the strongest op opponents in this fight so <laughs> i get to see a lot of it well yeah man we really appreciate you uh getting on the show you know my last little remark about it and i know i've said a few things but quit saying the patriot act and the freedom act is unconstitutional it's not everything the government does is constitutional why because the government interprets the Constitution so get off the pony look at what it is and say okay the government can do whatever the fuck they want because they're right. the only ones who interpret the Constitution that created them so <laughs> it, 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 
there's a Adam and Eve and God scenario in there, but uh, it, it you can't sit there and rail on and on and on and on. This is unconstitutional. We gotta get this. The, the government is too far gone to come back to where it started. Drop that pipe dream. It's gone. The body is 99% cancer now. <laughs> like, it's done. The show is over. Get out. So that's my last thing is, is the Patriot Act is constitutional, whether you want to hear it or not. It is. It's just it's helping you see how bad government is. That's right. Yeah. Well. I'll, I'll just echo that a little bit. I mean, it's it's not even the Patriot Act itself. It's not the Freedom Act it's, itself. It's not any of these bills that get enacted. It's it's the agencies that get put in place by these bills. That even if the bill itself is overturned or, or 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 things are changed, um, you know, you did you hit on that earlier, Michael, about how they um, you know they strip these bills and then they change them around and then they they hold on to them for a while and then they pass them eventually. I mean. For those conservative types that Dave is telling to give up completely, if you still if you still really want to believe in it, you still you know go start looking up these bills. I did that that was towards the end of my my attachment to minarchism. I started looking up old bills and I started looking down not just the bills itself, but the the, the whole the whole history of them and how they changed and how some major legis major legislation ended up being. Uh, the original bill, the only reason it even made it to the House and Senate floor originally, because it was something about something completely different, had nothing to do with what the actual act was. Um, and then that's that because it would never would have passed in the first place. It never would have got that stage in the first place if they hadn't snuck it in. So it's all a scam. It's all BS. Um, and, and if you're not worried about people looking at you, you know, take a look at those analogies people that got bandied around, you know, bandied around earlier about, you know, People looking at, you know, like Danilo said, people looking in in your bedroom. You know, I use the the wallet thing. You know, when people say, you know, if I have nothing, you know, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. I ask them to give me give me their wallet right then, <laughs> hand it over. If you have nothing to hide, let me let me see it. Let me see what you have in there. You know, like break everything down to that level, because otherwise, if you just keep trying to look at the bigger picture and saying, oh, I don't see it, because the whole attitude is it's the it's the NIMBY attitude. It's not my backyard. I don't see it. I, it doesn't affect me directly. I don't care. Well, yeah. if you really care about freedom, it's not only about yours. If you really care about freedom, you have to care about everybody else's just as much. So that's about it. I'll just end with a George Orwell quote. Um, In a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. So I think that's a, that, that's a wonderful uh, <laughs> description of, uh, of freedom, freedom lovers, truth tellers, <laughs> and they're being ostracized by their supposed friends. So, <laughs> Although we do gain new friends in the process. That's wonderful. <laughs> so awesome. Uh, thanks a lot, Michael, for coming on the show. We yes. really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Mike. And so uh, check out our donation stuff at the, at the website. We do this out of love, and that would really help us pay for some of the cost on this stuff we're looking to really expand to add more shows uh for pretty much every day of the work week for you guys and uh that's going to cost a lot to keep uploaded and um and distributed and and stuff we but uh we do this all out of love i don't care if i make one penny out of this thing yeah it's a labor of love definitely good stuff yeah yeah. Although my, although my wife would uh, would like me to make, but what, what are you gonna do? <laughs> 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 you, you can't you can't please family all the time, but <laughs> but yeah, donate to us on Bitcoin or Patreon. We'll uh, we accept any form of value you can send to us. You, if you want to send gold, silver, we'll, we'll we're not gonna complain. So <laughs> whatever you got. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, and thanks for listening. This is the Seize Liberty podcast. Uh, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Peace.